Um, hold on. Um, uh oh, it's connecting. It's connecting. Okay. That's fine. It's connecting. You're on. Good evening, and thank you for listening to WCEG Network on WCEGTalkRadio.com. Watch us live on your smart TV on YouTube under WCEG Network. I'm Vincent Cheeks, Vincent Cheeks, your show host for Conversations in Education for the next hour. We are the Worldwide Community Empowerment Group, where we speak life into the community. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and on Instagram at WCEG underscore talk underscore radio and at WCEG network. Last but not least, the topics and in in opinions are those of the show host and the guest and not of WCEG network. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it has been a while since we've been on, it's been about a month. And I'm sure everyone knows that there is a lot going on. But before we get into everything, we're going to discuss some heavy topics today. But before we get into that, I want to introduce my lovely guest that I have on my show today. We have uh, a group of sisters, young ladies who are emerging adults and uh, getting ready for this crazy world that we live in. And so I thought it would be a good idea to bring some of the youth on to the show, show to discuss some of these uh, topics that we have going on today and get the youth perspective and see how they feel, how they really feel about everything that's going on. So uh, my first guest is a 20 year old emerging adult. Uh, she goes by the name of Suhaila Collins. Welcome ma'am, how are you today? Fine, you so. I am doing quite, quite well. I'm always happy to be uh, working and doing my radio show. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. And my having. next guest, uh, she is a recent high school graduate and she has just started her summer classes uh, very recently. And she goes by the name of Sabira Mansour. How are you, ma'am? Good. Good, good, good to have you on. Great, and I love the look. You look beautiful, Strange. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and our last sister, but definitely not least, she is a new high school senior. Um, and so she's gonna be getting ready for this crazy world after another year. And she goes by the name of Salia Shahid. How are you, ma'am? I'm well. That is great to hear. And everyone here are sisters, correct? Yes, yes. That is absolutely wonderful. So I'm glad to have you guys with me. Um, we're going to get started into some heavy, pretty heavy topics. But before we do that, Penny, if you don't mind, I'd like to have a moment of silence. 8.4 seconds, if you don't mind. 8.46 seconds. Uh, a brief moment of silence to um, pay respects to George Floyd who of course lost his life uh, after being choked with a knee for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And then we're gonna be discussing Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, uh, Rashard Brooks, who was just recently killed um, this past Friday in Atlanta, Georgia. And I have to send a, uh, a big rest in peace shout out to um, Oluwatoyin Salu she is the young, the 19 year old young lady who uh, was a BLM protester and she was killed over the weekend, uh, unfortunately, by, unfortunately by another, uh, by a black male. And uh, I just wanted to pay respects to her. So can we have a moment of silence please for 8.4? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and if you didn't know how to guesstimate the 0.46 seconds, just do what I did and just guess. <laughs> okay, let's get into some of these topics that we're gonna be discussing today. Uh, I wanted to bring these young people on so they could give their perspectives on everything that's going on. The first thing I wanna start discussing is 
the current pandemic that we find ourselves in. So starting with you, Suhaila, because you're the eldest on the show, I want to get all of your opinions on the current pandemic that we find ourselves in with COVID-19. What are your thoughts on the whole thing? Um, at first, I just thought it was just like a regular, everybody's just mentally, like they just think they're sick. And, you know, I, was, I just thought it was a mental, I thought people was just like being extra. But, you know, going into it more and more, seeing the death rate increase and everything going on with it, I just was like, oh my God, this is really real. And um, be, me being an essential worker, you know, I've seen many people all types of shapes and colors, you know, just go crazy and everything. I was just like, you know, this is getting real. I don't know if we even make this one out alive. I hear all the time in music and um, just even on news shows, like 2020 is going to be that year. And, you know, every year, every month <laughs> in 2020 has hit, like some crazy stuff has happened, the bees, everything. I'm just like, did you say the I don't bees? know if I'm gonna make this one out. You know, the killer bees. The, the uh the murder hornets. Yes, the murder hornets. Yeah. Yes. I was just like, oh my gosh, like this is getting crazier and crazier. Like, and then now it's just like um the COVID plus the writing and everything. I'm just like, oh my God. You know, this is crazy, man. Yeah, it's it's been a little crazy. Thank you for that answer. Uh Sabira, you're next in the line of of, of elders. So you wanna chime in there? Um Honestly, I just want to say that it just brings a lot of questions to your mind. You know, there's a bunch of conspiracy theories, like what is it covering up? You know, what's the bigger picture? What is it trying to get us away from? You know, it's yes. just going to be a future lifestyle, you know, but sometimes it could be a good thing too, because um, this is given time for the earth to re heal itself from the things that us as human activities and yes. the things that we do, you yes. know? I feel like this is a bittersweet moment because we can't go outside and do what we're used to doing. But at the same time, it's giving, you know, you know, time to heal. Yes, that, that's a very valid point. Uh, there have been a lot of people that have stated that since we, us humans, have been in the house and not in the streets, that the, the, uh, the atmosphere is not as polluted. Uh, I know over in Italy, they stated that, you know how in Italy, you see the people rowing people on the boats through the city. They said the water over there is so clear uh, that you can actually see the fish and the, and the and, uh, species living in the water, actually swimming around in the bottom of the, the, the water over there now. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good thing that the earth is, is having the time to breathe a little bit, even if that means we have to be on punishment for a while. So thank yeah. you for your response, Sabira. Uh, Salia, what about you? What are your thoughts on this pandemic? Well, I, in the beginning, I definitely didn't think it was that serious. But as soon as like school had closed and everything started shutting down and the stores had emptied out, I thought like we would like the everybody's going to turn into a survival mode and like much crazier things is going to happen, like robberies and stuff but I'm glad it didn't go that way. And um, it's just, it's crazy to me how um, a disease can just kill off so many people quickly. So that's just my thought. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And, and to your point about things getting crazy and people robbing and stealing and, and just everything going to crap, if you will. Uh, my mother, she firmly believed that to the point where she went out and purchased a gun. And my mother is not a gun enthusiast. She is not a pro-gun person. And so I thought that was a bit weird and a bit extreme. But uh, then when I started hearing other people echo that, that same sentiment, like, oh, we're about to go into the purge. And you know, y'all seen the movie, The Purge, right? Yes. Where there's no law and people can just kill or do whatever they want for 24 hours, you know, that's what a lot of pe people thought was about to happen. Um, and some people still think may happen. So we're gonna pray that that does not happen because we don't need any more uh, craziness than we already have. So when this first came out, did you all hear about the fact that young people couldn't get it, couldn't get yeah. COVID? 
Yeah, they said black people uh, were immune to the disease. Right, they did. They said black people couldn't get it at first. They said black people couldn't get it at all. And then they said young people couldn't get it. So the first thing that I thought when I heard that black people couldn't get it was that this disease was designed for black people. Because anytime yeah. they say something that uh, it doesn't affect black people, I firmly believe that to be a whole lie. And I think it was designed for us in the first place, which I feel kind of validated by because it's attacking our communities in a much greater Especially number. right now. Especially. With everybody protesting. I don't think that's another reason why they're making a big deal about like everybody, oh, they're outside protesting. They're also spreading the COVID really fast right now, it's right now in every single state, every single country at the moment, it's just really like spreading because you know all, everybody's out on top of each other you know some have masks some don't yeah you're right and you know they say the virus can carry six feet um just talking regular so i can imagine how far it goes if people are screaming and yelling and in large groups and large crowds and stuff so very valid point uh Sabiria, what did you think about when you heard that young people couldn't get it did you believe it? Did you, what, how'd you feel? Like I said earlier, I just think that mo it's things that's trying to be covered up and it's a bunch of ideas down to the fact that we're being profiled um, from our social security. You could tell our ethnicity through our social security numbers, you know? Yeah. So when I heard that black people couldn't get it or young people could get it. I thought it was based on like strong immunity. So um, I wasn't too sure if it was just based on age because there has been cases from age ranges that's yeah. just been, you know, fluctuated. Yeah. But um, I don't believe it. Um, it would be selfish of me to say that I wish it was true because I am black, right. but um yeah, I disagree with it. It's too many cases. Right, it is. It's a lot of cases. And they, they, there have been proven cases that children can get it. What about you, Salia? I From the beginning, I just didn't believe it because I feel as though if it just depends on your immune system, whether if you have a, a stronger one or a weaker immune system. Because I think that anybody can get sick um, from this disease. Yeah, that is true. Anybody can get sick. You're absolutely right about that. So here's the question that I want to really want to know from all of you. And uh, I'm gonna start with Salia this time. How has the COVID-19 pandemic and all of this sheltering in place, how has it affected you personally? So personally, in the beginning, I was definitely going through like some mental challenges because I just felt stuck in the house. You're going through what challenges? Like meant to like, I feel like I was okay. stressing out, and so um, okay. I was stuck in the house, and we was we had to do a lot of schoolwork still, and it was harder because I wasn't learning anything. Um, they, it had ended my track season for me, so like my athletic ability had decreased, and um, it just in the beginning, and like, but like now, I just it's like it also opened up some things because like I haven't been outside to play since like I was a kid and so like okay. just going outside just like felt good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh Sabira. So hold on. So wait, you said it stopped your track season? Yes. Our we was in the middle of our track season. Well actually it just began and it ended it completely. Okay. And then you said when you went to when they went to the online classes how did that affect you my grades had actually lowered and then they um because like I just wasn't learning anything through the computer like I need that in-person teaching in person yeah and so yeah. when it just I'm glad like towards the end they had um did where like our grades won't be affected by the COVID-19 okay. so like my grades had went back up to where they were okay well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Sabira, what about you? How has this pandemic and sheltering in place personally affected you? 
for me, it goes back to the old saying of, you know, you don't know what you have until it's gone. Oh, say that again. Preach. Like, okay, because for me, I was a senior and I had so much to look forward to. I paid so many dues and um, activities off, prom, yeah. you know, stuff that the community put together for graduation. Yeah. And, um, you know, senior activities, we were supposed to go to Six Flags, for example, and we never got that trip. And um, I will also mention the fact that it's a lot of students who don't look forward to going to college, but uh -huh. the one thing that they wanted to manage was to walk through that state. They don't have a plan for what's past it, right. but walking through that stage mean a lot. Everyone has different stories. Yeah. And it means so much, you know, people carry people who passed or people they look up to on their shoulders when they grab their diploma and to have that moment taken away is 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 touching a sensitive spot. Right. And for me, I decided to take um summer classes. Okay. And initially the idea was to go on campus and take the classes and get a early start and experience of what, what I'm looking forward to. Right. You know, and just to get credits because my major is dental hygiene. I'm getting my associate's degree, okay. but that's something I still look forward to was to get that one-on-one uh, -on -one in person experience. And like Salia mentioned, I'm a visual learner as well. So knowing yeah. that I can have that um, emotional contact of when a teacher is teaching to demonstrate and explain something yeah. that I can't see in person, and, you know, to watch something online, virtual, it's, it's, a, it's a barrier, you know, it's something yeah. we all have to get used to. And when I was going to go vote, um, this one lady who was in line told me that her daughter te taught second grade. Mm -hmm. And in her county, they're discussing, you know, splitting a class in half and come, the students come in in every other day and all Fridays are like teacher work days. And you know, that's that's a lot of stress to put on an individual. Yeah, it is. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. So, well, the first thing I wanna say is congratulations. Thank for graduating. you. Graduating, you know, you put in the work, you did out of the, the effort and all that good stuff. So, uh, and I know you deserve it. So not being able to have an actual graduation ceremony does that, do you feel like that has, does that devalue your graduation or it just makes it feel a little off or different? For me personally, I had something different in mind. So it did touch a spot in me, but okay. I feel like it, it's motivational as well because it's like, if you could get over something like this, imagine how much more you would accomplish, you know? It's like, you can only go up from here. This is not the end. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Absolutely correct. Well, thank you for sharing. And Suhaila, yes, um, I know you're out of school. Uh, you graduated last year, correct? Yes. Congratulations to you as well. Thank that you. is a huge accomplishment, and I'm very proud of you, girl. Um, but Sue, tell us how has the pandemic personally affected you? I mean, I'm still blessed to still be at work. I mean, I work two jobs. Um, I, in both jobs, I still, you know, I w nothing was taken away from me or anything. However, you know, um, I've seen many, I work at Walmart, I've seen shelves go empty, you know, people fighting, spitting, somebody coughed, they're ready to fight. You know, I've seen, I've seen it all. I've seen every single kind of mask down to birthday hats being as masks, everything. I mean, birthday it's hat. yes, birthday hats, you get a little drinks that you put on the top of a cup. I've seen that as a mask before. I've seen it all. Like Walmart is funny. I mean, I work in an automotive shop. So we, that was one of the big things that were, was closed down. You know, I normally fix cars and everything, but we had to shut that down. Like immediately. I remember my manager just running was like, get out the cars, everybody shut the gates, everything. Like they need us on the floor. We need to guard tissue. How do you guard tissue? Guard tissue? Guard tissue. <laughs> I never had to guard tissue. That's the worst job. I don't recommend it to anybody ever. What? Like being, like my skinny self being pushed out the way just for some tissue. I 
the worst experience ever. Like, <laughs> wow. Yes. Um, but you know, it's I've seen difference in people. I've seen like the craziest brought out of people. You know, um, it, it's been an experience. It really has. Like, it's different. It's just, it, like. It, it is. It's, it's very different. And thank you for sharing. I was going to ask you to uh, share one of the craziest things you've seen at Walmart, but the garbage oh, kitchen was pretty crazy. I have stories for days. I have stories. Every day is something different. I'm sure it is. All right. Well, we're going to move on past that. We're not going to get into the crazy stories. Um, <laughs> but thank you all for sharing. Um, and one thing um, Salia mentioned, mental health, and it's very important for not just young people, but for everybody to keep their mental health in check. And when you're going through things and dealing with issues, find somebody to talk to about it, uh, whether it's your parents, whether it's a close friend, a cousin, whoever you can, sisters. I mean, y'all sisters, y'all live in the house, same house together. Y'all can talk to each other and just kind of help each other get through whatever situation it is at the time. And it's not just limited to young people, I promise you, because I was in the house for two straight months when the pandemic first hit and my mom treated you like a prison. You couldn't go nowhere. You couldn't do anything. You, it, it was terrible and I, and I couldn't do it. And I found out, uh, like you said earlier, Salia, I discovered about myself during those two months that I don't do good without people interaction. Like I don't do well without being, being able to see the people that I care about without being able to, dap up my home boys and hug my homegirls and, and just see people and exchange energy like that's normal stuff and this new normal they talking about this is not normal stuff being in the house being away from people that you care about not being able to do anything it's not normal so for me I had to remove myself from that environment and come back to Atlanta to get some sense of normalcy back to my life. And for me, that's what really calmed me down and got me <clears throat> out of the COVID funk that I realized I was, I didn't realize I was, I was in a COVID funk for two months until I got back to Atlanta. So mm -hmm. just make sure you keep your mental health um, healthy and make sure you have that one person that you can talk to. If you can't talk to anybody else, about what you're going through. Try to have that one person, best friend, cousin, auntie, uncle, whoever it may be. Um, I know I have a slew of friends that I can call at any time that I can trust with anything that I tell them uh, that if I need to just vent and get stuff off of my chest, I can do that. Mm -hmm. It's very, very therapeutic. So just remember that, okay? Protect your mental health. Okay, so let's get to talking about y'all president. So how do y'all think, uh, we're going to start with you, Sabira. <laughs> how do you think uh, President Donald Trump has handled the pandemic? For starters, my president is Obama still. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Duly <laughs> noted. <laughs> uh, my feelings is just, I try to bottle it up especially when you're outside because you never know who's listening and everyone's opinionated. So you mm -hmm. have to be very mindful of what you say, even though your feelings are very like powerful and yeah. because I feel like the tongue is a powerful tool too. And it's what he's saying and the actions that he's standing behind that causes the reaction that he's getting. Even yeah. the fact that he's shutting down in the hot in, in the house while we're all out fighting this and trying to figure out stuff, but he has other people sitting at tables and he just behind his desk twittering. Yeah. You know, he even tried to shut down Twitter because they wasn't agreeing with the stuff he was saying. Yeah. You know, and recently he even tried to say that women should expect to be sexually assaulted in the army because we're mixed with men. And what? with with what should we, this is what he said. He said, what do we expect by mixing two, two sexes together in the military? I did not hear him say that. Thank he said you. it's like 26,000 cases, un, unreported cases of sexual assault in yeah. the military. 
you're absolutely right. And I, I have read articles about that. Um, and But, okay, by the logic that you just said, that he stated, what, does that same logic apply to high school then? Because don't y'all go to high school? Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Boys? So does that's that what mean I was thinking high school too. girls or they should expect to get raped because they go to high school with boys like that? Logic doesn't even make sense to me. Yeah, it's just it just says so much that he just proved countless times of the person he is. And then it's yeah. more crazy that you have people that's just like, standing with signs with his name on it and they're supporting it so are y'all yeah. supporting great too right so yeah. you know it's a lot of questions and that's just one topic you know yeah. he said so yeah. much stuff and like i said just protesting the quarantine everything is take is you need to um focus on the fact that you still have hispanics in cages too you know it's still a bunch yeah. of stuff that it's still going on. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Salia, what about you? What do you What do you think about the job that uh, President Trump has done? I don't think he's doing a good job at all because it's like in the beginning when it first started and they were like enforcing us being in the house um, to do social distancing. I remember he was tweeting about having um, army troops on the streets to make sure we was in the house. And like also him speaking on um, like we should inhale uh, chemicals, oh my God. cleaning supplies to get yeah. rid of the COVID. So I'm just like, is he trying to help us or is he trying to kill us? Because like, why do we need the army troops <laughs> on the street? One and two, why are we going to inhale chemicals that would kill us? So it's just like, it's, everything is Twitter fingers and just, and I don't think he's, doing much to help not twitter fingers <laughs> that's that's you know and that's one of the problems that well a lot of citizens a lot of democrats and a few of republicans think is a huge problem with the president that he's always doing this with the twitter thumbs and then saying crazy stuff with the twitter thumbs that people didn't have to come up and make excuses for which shouldn't be a thing because he's the president of the united states which is supposed to be like the highest position in the world. Uh, and he acts like a giant toddler sometimes, right. a lot of times. And it's pretty disturbing and disgusting. But uh, thank you. Suhaila, what about you? What do you think about the job that uh, Mr. Trump is doing? Your president is doing the worst <laughs> job that he possibly can ever do. I'm like, not um, your president. <laughs> yes, because he had, he threw it he threw it on us, so he had to throw it back. Um, it's crazy. Um, I'm trying to, because he's done a lot, a lot. Like even down to right now, we're dealing with you know Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. some sticking the sticking the troops on us. Even with that, like come on now, we're we we have to move forward so we can't keep going back and forth right. and uh, we already had a civil war over this kind of stuff yeah you're gonna send the sick the troops on us again you know they don't want to be out there some of them want to help us some of them don't you know it's i think well, he's just the base of race like racial you know white privilege everything he's just the face of kkk all yeah. of that just, he got to yeah. go we need a new face in the house something different because I'm tired of Mr. Trump. Yeah. Okay, he's just over it. <laughs> I'm tired of him too. So, and we're going to segue into voting with that being said. Thank you, Suhaila. Um, I think there are a lot of people tired of this president. So, Salia, what, how, what do you think about our current voting system? And do you think that our current voting system works? Um, but, <laughs> well, I, I really don't know. I don't, I don't think it works, no, because it's just, it doesn't uh, make sense to me. And also it's just like, um, a lot of people don't vote and then be mad at the outcome and it's just right. like you can't be that mad because you didn't 
get up and vote. It's like people like me, I wish I could vote, but I'm, I'm not there yet. But when the time comes, I definitely will vote. Okay. Suhaila, what do you think about the voting system? And do you think our voting system works? Not right now, no, because I heard that the voting system was going to be on the computer. I'm like, like you can cash their vote and digitally. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, that's just another way for him to get back in office. It can easily be hacked. It can just go wrong so many ways. So when I yeah. saw that they was actually opening facilities up to let people go in and vote, you know, just with a certain number, I was actually kind of happy about that. You know, I was like, all right, cool. We got some way of going back to, you know, voting again. But like, I was just, when I first, I don't know, it was just weird. I'm not against, like we're going with the digital thing. I'm against it, but if we just go in and you know do it, the you know the way we're supposed to do it, I'm fine with it. Right. Well, there are people who are against the digital system, like you said, Me? Uh, but there are people who are against the handwritten system also, or the hand voting system, or what we've been using. Um, to me, I think you can cheat either way. Uh, I think Trump has been playing cheat since he won in 2016 to get another. When he cheated the first time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so I think he's been planning to cheat for 2020 for the past four years, uh, and I'm I'm really hoping that that doesn't work. But to both y'all point about the, the system not working or being broken, that's evident in the fact that in 2016, Hillary beat Trump by three million votes. Do y'all know that? Like no. she literally beat him by three million votes. Then the electoral college came in and was like, eh, nah, we don't like that. So we're gonna say that this happened and these states did this. And now he has the majority of electoral votes and now he's the president of the country and sending our country into ruin. But <laughs> anywho, so who, who did I not get? Sabira. What about you on the current voting system and does it work? Um, knowledge is simply key. Like, yeah. um, I think we had a side discussion the other day based on the fact that whose fault is it that people don't know who to choose, how the government works and, right. you know, yeah. I think it was discussed based on, is it the parents' fault? Is it the individual's fault? Is it the school system fault, you know, and um, that that could go a long way too, because sometimes, as you can see on social media, everyone was opposed. Then, you know, the Blackout Tuesday was a powerful movement. I feel like, and sometimes they don't know what to do when they get to the ballot, or a lot of people didn't even know about voting. Was it last week? Last week, yeah. Last Tuesday. Yeah, a lot of people didn't even know about that. Everyone was just commenting, like, when ce when celebrities, I've heard celebrities and rappers were saying, like, go vote, go vote, go register. Yeah. And they were just like, what are you talking about? It's not November and stuff. And just like, <laughs> no, that's not the only time. You yeah. know, sometimes yeah. it's about knowledge and what you know. And some people struggle with that. And it could be your community. It could be the way you was raised, right. not to care. So it goes. So. Well, let me ask you this, since you brought up whose responsibility is to teach this stuff to our younger generations. Is it the responsibility of the parents to teach children about uh, the political process and voting and all of that stuff and the history of it? Or is it the job of the school to teach young people about the political process and voting and all of that stuff. Sabir? To a certain extent, because I know when I was in school, it was, they were teaching us history, of course. And I actually went to a government class, but it was okay. based on that. You can't express your personal feelings towards politics in school, um, okay. just because it's a touchy subject. Yeah. So sometimes, when you go home, I feel like it is the parents' um, duty to okay. extend and bring that extra knowledge to the to their kids. Okay. All right. Thank you, Suhaila. Do you think it's your parents' responsibility? Do you think it's the school's responsibility? And well, no, or do it's you not think like it's yours? 
responsibility. I think is all uh, everybody plays a role because, like, I think yes, your parents should teach you about the voting system. Yes, the school, and yes, I, me as a person, I need to take responsibility in it. However, you pause it. What are we pausing for? Car. Oh, there's a truck out it's there. It's a car. Uh, stop. Okay, I got you. She's outside. There's a car. Uh, Salia, what about you? Uh, um, you think about the the voting. Whose job is it to teach? Is it the school's job? Is it your parents' job? Is it your job to learn on your own? I I think it should be all three. I more so agree with with, with what Sabera said because okay. um, I feel like if everybody just take a, a part in teaching and learning, then you learn a lot because voting is is like one of the strongest powers you have and to not have knowledge of it makes you weak because you don't know what you're doing. And um, yeah, I just think, cause, because I really think like this, you should learn about it yourself mainly because okay. um, if your parents are teaching you, you like, you, you like pick up on what your parents know or like if you, you vote who your parents vote for or not for like who you want to vote for. So I really think that like, you should be teaching yourself mainly to yeah. I feel like that's something that's going on now too with Trump supporters. You know, sometimes their parents are ignorant and they don't have no control over that. So that <clears throat> reflects onto the kid and they just have this opinion that came from their parents. You know? Right. Okay. So let me ask you this. Um start with you, Salia. Do you think Given the history of this country, given the history of voting in this country, <clears throat> do you think it's the responsibility of every black person to exercise their right to vote? Or is it okay for people to say, my vote doesn't count, that's why I don't vote, or I don't care about this political process, so that's why I don't, don't vote? What do you think, Sally? I do, I think everyone should vote, but if a person if a person had their personal beliefs on what they should do and what they shouldn't do, like that's them. But overall, I do think everyone should vote because like I said, that's power. And it is power. It's the country that you're living in. And you don't want somebody like the president we have now to be like ruining things for your country because like I said, you're living in it. Right. I absolutely agree. Uh Suhaila. <clears throat> Oh, am I finishing up the question before or? Yeah, yeah. I forgot you paused that question. Yeah, uh, which was um, about the voting process. No, who should teach? Who should teach um, about the voting process and political process? Uh, should it be your parents? Should it be your school? Or should it be yourself? Oh, I was saying all of them. I think everybody should be play a role in it. Teaching your like teaching and playing like that whole thing. Um, me personally, I had the um, privilege to attend two, two high schools. One okay. was in, in the hood. The other okay. one was, you know, more in the suburbs. Okay. Um, in the hood, they don't really have civics and, um, you know, government. They don't teach us that. It's more so we try to get you up out the door, you know, whether you're pregnant up in here or not. Right. You, know, you just got to go. We don't care what you do after you cross that stage. Whereas down here, you know, they want to teach you, like, this is the government. Not a lot of people know what the uh, elect the college is, you know, that has the final word in the voting system. Yeah. Not a lot of people don't. I, I'm still trying to figure out what they Look, mean. I didn't learn it till I was well into adult, in my 30s. Okay. So. Yeah. Imagine how many people who went to the same schools and they had the same background that I used to have. You know, they don't know what that is. They don't know anything about the voting system. So, you know, I think it definitely plays a role when you're teach when you're taught in school, you know, broken down, okay, who's this person, who's underneath this person, who are they, you know? And then, you know, it also plays a role, you know, in the home, you know, and just so. So I think that's it all is like all depends on who's teaching you what and how it, it like all that can mess with here, you know, you get to learn, you know, yeah. School, school, <clears throat> that's textbook learning, home is, you know, I guess hood, I won't say hood, but street learning, okay, you know, put yeah. them both together, it makes you, and then you, you're you. Yeah. So I think once all that comes together, you know, you're, you're going to put that vote in and you know who you are. Okay. So do you, to back to the previous question, do you think it's, do you think all black people have a responsibility to exercise their right to vote? 
Or is it okay for them to be like, eh, I don't really care? I think in the mindset, like of people, like the black people had today, it's like, oh, we don't, we never mattered, you know. So don't we never put the vote in before? Why does it matter now? But right. it actually does vote like matter. Even like when Obama, you know, everybody put their black their vote in, but it really didn't matter until white people started voting too. You know, saying, okay, let's give them a chance. So, you know, it don't like I said, I could say eh, it doesn't matter because I'm one of those people that was just like, eh, it don't matter. Even like last what week. I was like, it, you know, my vote technically doesn't matter until a white person outvotes. Like, it's, I think it's four white people against one person. It, uh, that's how I feel. Like, my okay. vote won't matter until somebody vouches for my vote. Okay. Um, this time is going by pretty fast. Uh, if you're listening to WCEGTalkRadio.com, this is Conversations in Education. I'm your host, Vincent Cheeks. I am on here with uh, three uh, very intelligent youths. Uh, in emerging adults, uh, they're giving their perspectives on everything that's going on in the world from COVID to the president to voting. Um, and we're, we're just having a hashtag casual conversation, get some things off our chest and uh, it's going really well. You guys are giving some great responses and I'm really, I'm really proud of uh, some of the things y'all are saying. Like y'all, y'all made me feel real good here. Your mom did a good job with you ladies. Um, <laughs> But uh, okay, so we're gonna move on. And uh, we've already been talking about some heavy things. So we're about to get into some more heavy things, right? So our social atmosphere right now is very tense. There's a lot of things going on right now. People we, on top of COVID aggressively attacking uh, people and especially attacking our communities, we have the police aggressively murdering our community for little to no reason at all. And so I'm going to mention a few of the high profile cases that are going on right now, and then we'll get into a discussion about that. First, we have Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, he was killed in South Georgia on February 23rd. He had gone for a jog in his neighborhood, and while he was out jogging, he was chased by two white men, one a former police officer and one, the other was the former police officer's child, the McMichaels. Uh, they jumped in their truck, they chased him, they grabbed guns, they jumped in their truck, they chased him through the neighborhood. They tried to cut him off and block him um, because they said there had been a string of robberies and crime in the neighborhood and they somehow thought Ahmaud Arbery fit the description of whatever this whoever the suspect was supposed to be so that's why they gave chase and basically hunted him down um ahmad eventually got tired of being chased by them and when uh wonder mcmichael stepped out of the truck the son uh ahmad went over to him <clears throat> and tried to grab the gun out of his hand and during the tussle ahmad got shot i believe twice in the chest and once in the hand and he tried to run off after that and he fell uh, after about five or 10 feet. Uh, the, the case went months without any arrest or anything been done, only until the video came out. Uh, there was a third person involved. He had followed behind the pickup truck that was chasing Ahmaud Arbery and he videoed it and he eventually got arrested also uh, and charged in Mr. Arbery's murder. So that was the Ahmad Arbery case. The next case involved Brianna Taylor. Brianna Taylor was, I believe she was 26 years old. She was an EMT. She was at home one night with her boyfriend and the police came to serve a no-knock warrant. If you don't know what a no-knock warrant is, that means the police, they get a warrant from a judge they're allowed to go into your house any time of the day or night without knocking, without calling, without giving you any advance warning that they're coming because they're trying to surprise you while you're sleeping or whatever and get whoever it is they're looking for. So the officers, this happened in Louisville, Kentucky. The officers went to Brianna's house. They broke into the house without knocking, without announcing themselves. Brianna's boyfriend came downstairs uh, with his gun because he thought someone was breaking into the house. 
Somehow, Brianna came down behind him. The officers let off 22 shots, eight of the shots hitting Brianna Taylor and killing her in her own home. And the worst part about this situation, as if that isn't bad enough, is not only were the police at the wrong address, but the person that they were looking for had already been captured earlier that day. So this young lady literally died for no reason at all. Um, <clears throat> And that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty tough pill to swallow. Uh, I mean, for that family, for the community, and even for me as an individual. I mean, I just I, I can't make sense out of that at all. <clears throat> and then next we have, of course, George Floyd. George Floyd was killed May twenty fifth. Um, he was at a, a store, a neighborhood store, and bought some cigarettes and something else. The people at the store claimed that he used a fake $20 bill. They called the police on him. Uh, when the police got there, Mr. Floyd was still hanging around the store. They went to speak to him. They eventually ended up putting him in, putting him in handcuffs. And somehow he ended up on the ground while he was in handcuffs with not one, not two, but three officers on his back. He's on his stomach. So two of the officers are on his back. The other one has his knee in his neck with his hands in his pocket and he and he's there for eight minutes and 46 seconds which i can only imagine is a very 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 long time especially when you're in the process of being murdered uh for this happened about three weeks ago so for for me for about three weeks ago i didn't even i didn't even follow the news or any news articles about the george floyd killing anything i heard about it was from other people because from the moment I initially heard about it and I saw the picture, the still picture of this cop with his knee on this man's neck, I knew I had, I was just coming out of my COVID funk and I knew I didn't want to read about anything that might take me back to that COVID funk. Um, so I just avoided it. And I didn't really start researching Mr. Floyd's death until this past weekend when I was getting ready for the show. So I did watch the video the video I watched was very hard to, it was very hard to watch. It didn't have sound, thankfully. So I didn't, I didn't hear him begging for his life. You know, I heard the stories, people telling me he was, he was saying he couldn't breathe. He was saying his back hurt. He was saying his chest hurt. He was saying that they're going to kill me. And the police still didn't take any of the pressure off him to the point where the officer that's charged with his murder, Derek Chauvin, got so comfortable with his knee on his neck, he was able to put his left hand in his pocket and just chill nonchalantly with his knee on this man's neck. Um, and I'm glad what I saw didn't have the volume because I, I would have hated to see and hear this grown 46 year old man begging for his mother as he was dying. And then I found out this weekend that his mother's already passed. So he's begging for his mother and she's already passed away, but he knew something terrible was happening to him. Um, and that's a very hard case for me too. The officer, Derek Chauvin, has been charged in that case. Well, all four of the officers that were involved in that case have been charged. Uh, Derek Chauvin has been charged with uh, second degree murder. The other ones have a lesser charge, uh, but they're trying to get those charges upgraded. So uh, that was the George Floyd situation. The country, all over the country and all, all over the world has been processing for the past three weeks because of how blatant, uh, how blatantly disrespectful the murder of George Floyd was. Um, and so there have been mad protests. There have been protests here in Atlanta. There have been police precincts being torched. There have been police cars being torched. There have been police officers being attacked. Um, so it's a very, very crazy situation going on right now. And in the middle of that craziness that's going on while people are out protesting police brutality and police murdering innocent people. This past Friday night here in Atlanta, Mr. Rashad Brooks, a 27 year old man was murdered by two Atlanta police officers. He had fallen asleep in his car in the Wendy's uh, drive through on University Avenue here in Atlanta. The police were called, they came, they woke him up. They were speaking to him. They were, they were giving him a breathalyzer test and everything seemed to be going fine until out of nowhere, after the breathalyzer test, 
the police officer didn't inform Mr. Brooks that he was arresting him. He just took his handcuffs off and just started putting the man in handcuffs. So Mr. Floyd, uh, sorry, Mr. Brooks, whether he was intoxicated or just out of it for whatever reason, I don't, he probably panicked given the, the current situation and everything that's going on, he panicked. So he, he did start fighting the cops. He took a taser away from the cop and he started running from the cops. All of that is no excuse for this man to have been shot in his back three times and murdered in this Wendy's parking lot. So that ignited more protests. Uh, the police chief in Atlanta resigned the next day. Uh, more protests have increased. The Wendy's got burnt down on Saturday. Uh, so people are just really emotional. People are really angry. People are taking out their frustrations in any way they can, which I really can't condone. I mean, I can't condemn. I can't condemn anybody for reacting the way that they're reacting, given the situation that so many Black lives are being taken for no reason at all. So with all of that going on, how do you all feel about these cases that I've just mentioned to you? Is there anyone that is there anyone in particular that sticks out to you more than the other ones? Because I know for me, I've been trying to figure out which one of these cases was worse. The innocent young man that got killed in his neighborhood jogging. The innocent young lady that got killed in her house while she was sleeping by the police who broke in. The black man, 46 year old man who died with a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, begging for his mama and begging for them not to kill him or the man who, the innocent man who was sleeping in the drive-thru and died in that parking lot. I, I really don't know. I don't, I don't know which one is worse. They're all terrible. But what are your thoughts on these situations and how does it make you feel to see other black people being murdered on camera? Uh, Suhaila. Um, it's actually really sad. I really can't put which one is worse because at the end of the day, murder is murder. Murder is murder. And I, Thank yeah, you. I don't want to see anybody die, but to see my brothers and sisters being killed on the street or in, even in their homes, cars or anything, is actually really, really sad. Um, me, I, um, even if I, I mean, I can't really discuss it, even at like at work, I can't discuss it because they just be like, see what you say, this is the wrong neighborhood, you know. You know, I feel like my voice doesn't matter. And I, I would love to go and march in the streets, not looting, just march, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, be a part of this movement. However, you know, again, the COVID is going around, spreading faster. And the um, fact that, you know, it's just, it's crazy. You know, I still, I still have to, you know, even with the jobs that I have, I still have to pay rent and stuff like that. I can't just yeah. take off work. But I would love to, I would love to talk about it with, you know, people, I, I remember trying to even speak at it at work and, you know, just to a regular co-worker and it turns out that co-worker was, he actually applauded the police. You know, he was just like, no, I, I don't care, you know. He applauded the police, that's he what you said? It was a, a young man at my job, he applauded, he was just like, look, yeah, he should have never, he was like, wrong time, wrong place. And I was just like, okay, this, I understand why, you know, they were telling me not to speak at work. But I was just like, sorry, like, you know, that's not cool. The guy's actually pleading and saying, please get off my neck. Yeah. He was like, no, no, no. You know, every he's a like, one man passes away with a knee on his neck and the whole world goes crazy. I don't understand. It's just like all lives matter and all this other stuff. And I'm just like, okay, you know, sorry. You know, I had to like refrain, you know, yeah. I'm at work at the moment. I cannot beat you up at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. Chance. yeah. However, you know, I was just like, I understand, you know, all lives do, do matter. However, at this moment, you know, I have to break it down to them, you know, mm -hmm. we are getting killed left and right, whether it's from our client, whether it's from the police, but we're being hunted down yeah. right now. Even in China, we're being hunted down. And I'm just saying, telling him, like, you know, I had to explain to him, just stop speaking to me at the moment. You know, I need the time to breathe and, you know, refrain from wanting to jump on you at the moment. He called me all kinds of keywords and that I needed to pick a side. He called and you B like, word. No song. Yes, the whole B word. For what? He told me that I y'all disagree? Be because I told him to leave me alone, and I didn't want to talk about the subject anymore. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, Sabira, uh, thank you, uh, Suhaila. Well, let me let me just say this, Suhaila. Uh, thank you for sharing that. We have to be careful when we engage in these conversations, especially when we engage in these conversations with people that disagree with our viewpoint. And there are a lot of people out there. And some people that disagree with our viewpoints, they just want to agree with the police just because they're the police. Some people that disagree are racist. Some people that disagree truly don't understand um, where we're coming from. And uh, I, I got into a discussion last week with a white female friend of mine. And we were talking about the protests and stuff going on here in Atlanta. And she had an issue with the Black Lives Matter statement. Uh, she said somebody came up to her and said Black Lives Matter and she got offended and you know, attack them or whatever. And, you know, she gave the all lives matter reply and gave, told me why she gave the all lives matter supply because, you know, she felt like all lives matter and black lives are no more important than in the other life. And I let her speak. I let her give her a spill. I didn't get upset uh, because I looked at it as a teachable moment. I always look for teachable moments. And so when she finished, I, I explained to her that the statement Black Lives Matter does not mean that Black lives are any more important than any other life. I told her what you said, same thing you said, Suhaila, that Black lives are the ones that are being snuffed out at a higher rate, especially by the police. Um, and Black lives are the ones that's being hunted down and being killed for little to no reason at all. So when we say Black Lives Matter, it doesn't mean that just Black Lives Matter. It says- We're just shining it, a light saying, on it. Huh? Just shining a little light on it. Yeah, it's saying that all lives will not matter until Black lives are included in that all lives statement. Right. And so my friend, she listened to me and she took it in and she said, oh, I never really heard it explained like that before. And she didn't say anything else. And we just kind of ended the conversation, but we were able to have that exchange without blowing up at each other without calling each other out, out each other's name, like the B word, which is once you, once you're having a debate with somebody about something and they start calling names and, and things of that nature, uh, it, it is no longer a debate. It has devolved into something that needs to be walked away from. So I'm all about debate. I'm all about open discussion, but we have to know where we are mentally when we're having these debates, because some of us are so emotionally gone and so emotionally angry that it's going to come out wrong. It's going to come out name calling. It's going to come out disrespectful. And so we have to be aware of that. Uh, but I think you did a good job of just stating you didn't want to talk about it no more than just trying to get away from the situation. We have to learn how to choose our battles not just in situations like that, any time in life. So I commend you for knowing that you were getting ready to go to a negative place and trying to walk away from the situation. That's That shows a, a very high level of maturity. So good job with that. Um, uh, Salia, you wanna jump in here? Uh, what do you think about these cases I just mentioned? Do you think one is more egregious or worse than the other? Uh, just how do you, how do you feel about it? I agree with Sahela that murder is murder, but I don't okay. like all of this is not okay. I don't like seeing that like we're just being murdered and um like we're animals and slaughtered and stuff. Yeah. And I had to take a break from social media because um like people took it as a joke and like doing the George Floyd challenge, you know what that is? George Floyd challenge, no. It's, what is it's the challenge where there's someone laying on the ground and somebody else with their knee in their neck and saying like mimicking him. Are you and, serious? Yes. And so I really had to take a break from it because then that yeah. also social media, because it's still on social media, is like the whole all lives matter um, everywhere. And like, it's just like that statement is so false because black lives don't matter. And that's why we're saying black lives matter. And so like to, so that all lives will matter. And so I just like, I didn't like, I had to take a break because I didn't like seeing like white people comparing to black people being oppressed. And just they just like, well, my rights are being taken away too. How are they being taken away when we're trying to make things equal? So right. just like, I just, I, I couldn't do it. I like what you just, how are your rights being taken away when we're just trying to make things equal? That needs to be on a t-shirt, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, I'm sorry, were you finished? 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I like that. How are your rights being taken away? We're just trying to be equal. Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> Sabira, uh, what about you? What do you think about these cases? Um, how do you feel about seeing uh, Black lives being murdered on, um, on camera? On you hear about these um, stories from time to time, but hearing you recite them back to back, it's just hard for me right now to sit here and like not get emotional because yeah. you look out the window and you see on TV and you just want to zoom in and say, is that me? Like right. in my next. Right. So um whew. to be the officers to be doing this, it's like, how can you sit there without feeling guilty? How can you go home and yeah. eat at the table and go to sleep at night without feeling like you don't have no consequence because the color of your skin, you know, yeah. they do this because they know that they, they can get away with it. And yeah. it's moments like these where we stick together and it's that last straw that breaks the camel's back that we want to have a voice together and unite. And that's when it's things that like go back to where you came from. But yeah. honestly, you wasn't here either. You know, you have Native Americans in, country, in camps paying them not to leave, to take back what's there. Yeah. And they don't know nothing. They get paid to stay there. And then all they could use it on is, you know, drugs, the bar, gambling, you know, this is all they know. So for us, it's like we have targets on their back. And I say that none of these stick out more than the other because they're all on a pedestal to me, you know? Yeah. And I feel like we have the right to feel the way we do because we relate. This is us. That is me. So... For me, I'm black, I'm Muslim, and I'm a female. I have three targets on my back. So to yeah. be in your house and chilling or just sitting in your car sleeping at Wendy's and stuff, these are our jogging. These are our daily activities. It's only a running yeah. track. Who's to say if my sister is running in the neighborhood that she gets shot? Yeah. And I, um, I, I can I can hear the pain in your voice and I can feel the emotion. Um and, it, and it's that it's that heavy of a situation and it's that serious of a situation that it, it needs to be addressed and it needs to be there needs to be something done about it now because we're in the year 2020 and this has been going on for too long and it shouldn't continue to go on at the rate that it's going on at, or at all period so so in some of these cases uh they might Arbery, those people were arrested uh, and are facing murder charges. Uh, Breonna Taylor, nothing has happened in that situation. Yeah. There have been no arrests in that situation in the, the Louisville Police Department's pretty much been trying to sweep it under the rug. Uh, George Floyd, we had four of the officers, the, the four officers arrested uh, and are facing murder, murder charges. And with Richard Brooks here in Atlanta, uh, the police chief stepped down. Uh, the officer that pulled the trigger was fired. And the officer that um, was there on the scene with the officer that pulled the trigger was put on administrative desk duty. So my question to you all is, when these type of situations happen with these police officers, what do you think should happen to the police officers? Should they just be fired and let go from their police department? Should they be fired and charged with murder? What should happen? Should they lose their uh, police pensions, which is you know basically their retirement money for when they uh, get done with their police work? What do you think should happen uh, to officers that are involved in situations like this? Uh, Salia. Um, I think they need to be fired and charged and because it's just, it's not okay. And like, they just, like Sabrina said, they just go home and they get to sleep at night with their family while they yeah. just, they just took away from somebody else's family. And that's not fair. And it's not justice either. So like for justice to be served, it needs to be served. And I think that they should be like, um, what I just said, um, fired and 
charge. Yeah, charge. My mind just went blank. No problem. You're good. Um, Suhaila, what about you? Um, I think these thugs just need to, you know, <laughs> thugs need to go. I like what you like, did. Like be there. put in jail. Like, I don't think they like should be able. They need to be stripped. You know, they have their badges stripped of badges, stripped of their dignity, like yeah. everything. Like just. Put them in their nice little, and I want to say nice little cell. Put them, lock them up, okay? Because that's what we do to thugs. We, we lock them up. Yeah. And um, I don't think that they should be able to just be go home. And, you know, hey, you know, um, even with the, I forgot the one, I forgot the guy's name, the one with the Skittles in the, uh, uh Arizona. Trayvon Martin. Yeah, it's Trayvon Martin. His killer actually came out one day, just went to the bar and just was happy, happy like happy. Oh, um, yeah. I killed this boy. Y'all know who I am. I'm a, I'm a face. Uh, you know, I'm just like, how do you have this bragging right? And how many are there that's actually still bragging about, you know, y'all, y'all killed these people. I'm a face. I'm, you know, see me on that paper and all this other stuff. You know, it's sad. I don't think that they should be, like, the fact that you're even outside still is just unable to walk around. Like Sonia said, like, you get to live your life while you just took a life yeah. of an innocent person. It's just, this is it's, nasty they're disgusting i just can't yeah it is very frustrating to know that like because if any one of us did any of these things to another human being we would be thrown under the jail especially if you got melanated a melanated hue to yourself okay um so you're absolutely right um sabira what about you what do you think should happen to these police officers that are caught up in these situations who murder innocent people and who seem to show no remorse for it? Um, I definitely think that they should speak be, up a little bit. I definitely think that they should be um, accounted for their actions because if it was any of us, like Suela said, we, we would be thrown in jail immediately. No question mm -hmm. about it. But murder is murder. So where is where are these actions that was taken so fast why is there a question especially yeah. if there's so much surveillance that's given and you know with citizens it's like what can we do but record it's kind of cowardice but like when you see someone knee on someone else's neck who do you call when the, yeah. the police is there you know so it goes multiple it's so many emotions that go to it, but definitely they should be account for the actions. Yeah, I uh, I agree with everyone. I definitely think uh, police should be fired. They should be charged and convicted. Uh, being charged is not enough. Some people get very happy just because they've been charged. No, we need a conviction in all of these situations. Um, we need an investigation in the Breonna Taylor situation because there has still not been any consequences for this young lady losing her life. And even to the point they tried to charge her boyfriend with attempted murder of a police officer because the police officer broke in his house and he shot one time at them. Uh, thankfully, the charges were dropped against him. But still, there has been no consequences brought against these people for taking this young lady's life. And not only taking her life, I learned this today when when Brianna, uh, Brianna Taylor's boyfriend, I can't remember his name, he called Brianna's mother. Brianna's mother got to Brianna's house to the scene to find out what's going on with her daughter. The police, while, while Brianna was in the house dead, the police lied to Brianna's mother, told her that an ambulance had taken her to the hospital and told the mother to go there to look for her. So the mother goes to the hospital, looks for her for there for two hours, and then is told that they don't have Brianna Taylor there. So the mother goes back to the apartment. The cop still doesn't tell her that Brianna's in there dead and says she has to speak to some detective. She waits about four to five hours at the apartment complex to speak to this officer, which she never had a chance to speak to. Uh, I think Bri Brianna Taylor's death happened about one in the morning, uh, whatever night it happened. They didn't tell Brianna Taylor's mother that she was dead until 11 a.m. the next morning. And how That's, long was her body on that floor? Right. <laughs> While her body's in the house the whole time, dead. Um, and it's stuff like that that I don't understand how police officers can get away with that stuff. Because 
it was multiple officers on the scene. It was multiple officers trying to throw her mother off or, or sweep this thing under the world. And there's still multiple officers, uh, sergeants, chiefs, mayors, governors, still trying to sweep this thing under the rug because nobody wants to bring charges and hold these people accountable for the actions that they have taken. Well, somebody's going to be need to be, need to be held accountable because this young 26 year old uh, professional young lady lost her life for no reason. And so, yeah, they need to be fired. They need to be charged. They need to be convicted. They need to lose their uh, police pension and the police department that they work for should have to pay for the funeral and should have to compensate these families with money. Uh, from what I understand, the typical rate of uh, payout that they, they give when the city does have to pay for an abusive officer uh, and the loss of life of an innocent person, the city usually pays about $1.2 million. That seems to be the going rate and the going price for life of a black person. Uh, I know for me and mine, that wouldn't be sufficient because people want their family members with them. People want their friends with them. So there's no amount of money that could compensate and make up for you wrongfully taking somebody's life. Like that's crazy to me. So I think if you have immediate actions with firing, charging and convicting these police officers, you will see a decrease in uh, innocent black people being killed. If you add a monetary amount to it, whether it's the person paying personally or the police department or the city having to pay uh, for this wrongful death, somebody needs to be hit in the pocket. And that seems to be the only thing that white racist America understands is money. So if you start hitting them in the pocket, then they will definitely, um, definitely start reconsidering before they're doing some of this stuff. So because of all the police brutality, the innocent loss of life, there have been mass protests going on. Some of the protests have been peaceful. Some of the protests have broken out into riot, rioting and looting. What are your opinions of the, pro uh, the protests? Uh, we're gonna start with Suhaila. What are your opinions of the protests? And do you think do you think the people are going about it the right way? Meaning, should all the protests remain peaceful or do you think it's okay for it to get a little bit out of hand sometimes because sometimes that's the only thing people will understand or that's the only time we're being heard? Uh, Sue, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. Um, I'm more of a Malcolm X kind of person. I believe you know in action. However, you what? You know, I believe in action. Okay. Um, yes, I do think like if you're peacefully peacefully protesting, I you know, I'm all for it, everything, you know, different. You know, however, you know, there's a certain way to go about certain things. And um right now I don't believe in I don't think the looting is okay. I, and then some of the people that's actually like I actually spoke with a group of teenagers and I'm like what because they came into my store trying to I guess loot it. And I was like, what is the point? What, like, do you even know what you're doing? And you're just like, oh, just trying to get some shoes and everything. Yeah. I'm just like, do you actually know why everybody's looting and destroying things? Right. Oh, we're just trying to get some clothes and stuff. No, it's, you know, Floyd. You know, I think it's just not everybody's here when it comes down to stuff. Some people are just going out to just get items. Nobody's actually, oh, this is for, you know, George. And I don't even think George would even want that, the looting and everything. But I think, like the protesting, I stand behind the protesting. I do. I think change needs to be done now. However, you know, I don't think people should just, you know, destroy their where they're where where right where they live. I yeah. don't think that is right. You know, you know. I know some people are like, well, we built this up. We can take bring, like burn it down and everything. No, no, you're burning down your home and yeah. everything. You know, I, I I actually like the Black Lives Matter, you know, the artwork in the street. I'm all for that, you know, but the vandalizing okay. and everything that's going on with that, right, going, you know, doing, you know uh, the destruction, I'm not for it, you know. Okay. However, I'm here for the peaceful protesting and the, uh, you know, everybody, get, you know, the police being put in jail, you know, voices being brought out, everybody's even coming up, bringing up old cases. Okay, you know, all right, we got George, good. 
All right, let's bring up this old case. Let's keep this person. All right, we got them. Next person. I like that, you know. Yeah. All right, that's, that's you know, I like that. However, you know, just the damage and everything, I'm not for it. We're going to okay. have to pay for it later. Yeah, <laughs> you're right about that. Somebody got to pay for that damage. Um, but And I agree with you to a certain extent about I, I, I'm all for the protest. And up until last week, um, I wasn't really for the destruction and the rioting until I heard somebody else's perspective and they gave me a new outlook on it. But I'm going to mention that uh, after I give your sisters a turn to speak about the protest. Uh, so Sabira, what do you think about the protest? Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, is the rioting and looting good or bad? How do you feel? Are they doing it right or wrong? I agree with the unity because I feel like this moment is just bigger, bigger than us. It so is. with that said, it's not about shoes. It's not about getting that Prada bag you always wish for on Instagram. You know, it's not it's not about personal use. It's about standing together and, and saying what's right. Yeah. So when looting mm, to protesting, yes. But I think one thing that's not looked at is, you know, the pandemic too. It shows a big statement just to say that people are risking their health to say, yeah. you know, we matter. Yeah. That that's a big statement. It is. We're not standing six feet apart. We stand in in arms locked together in front of your face. Yeah. So I feel like that's that's a statement right there um to start off with. But with looting, I I don't really agree with it, but I can understand it. You know? Yeah. But I will also say that it was no organization to it. I feel like if if you really wanted to make a statement, you would loot white owned stores, you know? Right. You would stop going to places that's white owned or just not black owned period. It's nothing right. against the other races who aren't white, but it's stuff like not going to the beauty store. And I know that's hard for the females, but there's a lot of Asians that own the beauty stores. Yeah. But there are small businesses that are owned by black people that you just never know about. There's yeah. website websites and resources to, you know, our phones are on the fingertips. It's our power and no one uses it for the right reasons. Search your nearest small black owned store, yeah. you know, it's some of the stuff that people that black people are so intelligent that they hide in their house with their talents yeah. because they don't feel comfortable or have the self-esteem to open up a store because they don't they don't feel like no one has their back not even their right. own people not even so i feel like there's so much stuff we could do if we stand together we have black wall street and as soon as we started to uplift each other in that matter it was destroyed yeah. So and I feel like that's a big threat to people. And like I said, with us standing together and they know how powerful we could get, yeah, you know, that's when the statements like go back to where you came from. Yeah. Because they are threatened. And for example, my mom was talking to me about how she doesn't plan on going to Home Depot anymore. That's always been her um, to go to DIY store, anything she wanted to do in the house. Mm -hmm. You know, she's planting, doing vegetables with her, you know, expanding her green thumb at this moment during yeah. this quarantine. And she was just telling me how she plans on going to Lowe's because it's black owned. And and another thing you have to look at with these blowing up these Wendy's and Targets and stuff is that some of these businesses are franchised. Some of these franchises are owned from black people. Yeah. So it's it's research that I say that what comes with the looting that you have to do research too. It has to be organized. I, I agree with the unity and I agree with the statement, but you know. Okay. Don't just de don't destroy anything that means right. something. Right. And and to your point uh about the destroying and and, and your own neighborhood, it, it's not I've read a lot of articles that have stated that a lot of the looting and rioting, uh, especially in Atlanta, was done by people that were not from Atlanta. They were people that came in from um, other places. And even with the government, you know, I don't know if you know about this, but back in the 60s and 70s, the, go the government had a, a program called COINTELPRO. 
and COINTEL Pro was to meant to go into any black organization, especially the Black Panthers. They were meant to go into these organizations and disrupt whatever uh, they had going on. They were called agents of chaos or provocateurs. Uh, the government would send these people in and you be the one to start trouble because they know all it takes is one person to start doing some crazy foolishness. And then there's other people there that already have that feeling or, or uh, their emotions are high that they know other people are going to join in. So they send in these provocateurs or these agents of chaos and say, you know, we're going to put a brick right here or some bricks in this area. You be the first one mm -hmm. to throw the brick and then watch how the rest of them come and grab and throw bricks and stuff. And so a lot of that goes on. I, I think a lot of things that the black community fails to see and fails to realize is how many games uh, the United States government has played with our lives since they brought us here in the 1600s. Um, to me, I feel like they have been using us for guinea pigs for a very long time, social science experiments, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but you 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 have a thing. Um, thank you, uh, Salia. Uh, what are your thoughts on the protest? And are they doing it right, wrong? The rioting, the looting. How do you feel about all of them? Um, I have a lot of mixed feelings about it because I do agree with it, and it's, um, I would prefer peaceful protesting, but um, it it doesn't seem like nobody's being hurt when you're peacefully protesting. But it's also that. You don't have to. You don't have to loot a place to um, to get your point across. You can go on strike, like like how back in the day with Rosa Parks, they didn't burn down the buses. They they went on strike and like um, no one got on the buses because either way they're still not getting their money. You can loot, they won't get their money, but you can also just go on strike and they still won't get their money to to get because you know they love their money. And it's also like with the the burning down the buildings and stuff. It's like that same Wendy's, what was his name? That he was in the Wendy's. Hey, Wendy's, Rashard Brooks. Yeah, it, at that Wendy's, um, it, it was a video that surfaced that it was a white, you see a white woman burning down that building. But yeah, yeah Penny it, just it, mentioned it, that. Huh? Penny just mentioned that in the chat about the white uh, woman burning the Wendy's. Yeah, and it's just, mm -hmm. but of course it's going to be looked at, oh, black people did this because yeah. like, they're animals and this is why that we need to do this and the third to them and that's why they need to be gone and out our country and stuff like that but it's not us and it was also like you said with the bricks I, it was also this other video where before it was a plant protest and before the process even started there was a set of bricks um stacked up and it was like they said it was no construction work in sight and like like yeah. plant for people to act this way because they want you to they want you to be looked at as animals yep yeah, you and you're absolutely right. Um, and things like that are designed to distract. Uh, Sabir mentioned distraction earlier. Things like that are meant to distract from the main message of the protest, which is we're tired of being killed in the streets like dogs. We're tired of police brutality. We're tired of racism. We want something to be done about it now. And so, yeah, that I feel like it's it's a it's kind of a tricky subject because so many people go out there with good intentions and with the right message and to do the right thing and all it takes is one or two bad apples to spoil it for the whole bunch um which should not be the case and i, I don't know what organizers of these protesters can do to make sure that they stay peaceful and to make sure that you don't have these agents of chaos coming in to cause destruction. I don't know what, I don't know what can be done about that. Um, I'm definitely in agreement with the, with the protest. Like I was saying before, I didn't really agree with the destruction and the looting, especially of your own neighborhood and communities. Um, and some of those businesses are black businesses that you're burning up. Uh, and we already have it hard enough as it, as it is. But I saw this video last week and I can't remember the young lady's name, but she made a very clear and valid point. She was talking about, she was talking about how people are complaining about people doing the looting and the rioting and stealing stuff, stealing TVs and shoes and Gucci purses and all this stuff. Um, and people use that to demean the protest or take away from the protest. And they use it to say, it's your fault. But her point was, y'all brought us here 
Y'all made us live under your um, rules of your society, which was based on white supremacy and racism. Um, and you told us that if we assimilate and fit in and do what y'all want us to do, that everything will be fine. And she was like, we did that. We did that. We came here as slaves. We built this country up with blood, sweat, and tears. And we agreed to the social contract that y'all put out to us saying, if you do this, everything will be fine. If you do this, you will stay out of trouble. If you do this, you won't get killed. And she said, we agree. We agreed to the social contract. She said, but then you come with your goons and thugs, like Suhaila called them, and you shoot us down in the streets like we're dogs. You take away our family members to prison and, and, and give them uh, overly harsh sentences. And when you do those things, you are the one who is breaking the social contract. And so when you, as white supremacy and white supremacist and racist, when you break the social contract that y'all made us sign, there's no longer a social contract. And so because there's no longer a social contract anymore, we don't care about your stores. We don't care about your police precincts. We don't care about your cars. We care about y'all not killing us. And until that message is heard and until that message is gotten, then it's going to continue to be what it is. And I really felt that because she had a point. She was right. Like, we didn't ask to come here. We didn't ask to be here. And we were here. And we did what we were told to do unwillingly at first. And then when we got our freedom, we still did what we were told to do. And you're still killing us. So we dang, we, we're darned if we do, we're darned if we don't. So Because they own us. We're uh, their property down to Social Security. We are nothing but money to them. So the way they look at it is that... Um, you know, that's my money. That's, you know, you know, you know how you look at what you, you know, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. You know, that person, I own them down all the way down to their organ. Oh, I may need that organ. Let, right. me, take that, let me take my organs and give it to something else. You know, it's yeah. mine. You know, they own us all the way down to our social security number. And now I think that is something that people need to look into. Like, can we, can we own ourselves? Can we? Like, not be just that black person or that Hispanic, that white person. Can we, why are we just colors? You know, I am a person. I'm right. some healer, you know. Can yeah. I, like, why am I just numbers? Why am I just money to you? And, you know, why Why do you, why can you, are you like, you're God. Why do you have to say so when I can be taken out of this world and when, like, what time of day and everything just because I'm looked at as numbers? Right. Yeah, you're yeah. right. I, be um, I believe in um, modern slavery. It, you could just look at the communities you're from. We're from Philly originally. And just the lifestyle that we were surrounded on, on convenience stores on every corner, literally every corner. And um, to just the placement of how they put stuff and the way city planners mark off territories of how this neighborhood and this zip code is going to um, evolve. You know, I believe in Are you talking about gentrification. Red Excuse me. You're talking about redlining. You said yeah. when the different neighborhoods are, yeah, yeah, that's called redlining, where they would section black people off into the poorest areas or into the hoods, and then they would allocate money to the other areas and none to our yeah. areas. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like most of it is out of our control, and it's the belief of, yeah, we don't have chains on you, literally, but look around you do you have limits on opportunities if somebody if the the cases of black people coming up is way lower than any other race so i feel like we have to fight and we have to struggle way more than most of the people out here yep. to get to where we want and yeah. it's not we don't have silver platters to guide us right. or you know yeah we don't and we don't have those silver platters because i don't know if y'all know this but the wealth of america was built on the backs of slavery the majority mm -hmm. of america's wealth and money came from the money that they made during slavery um 
So yeah, we uh, a lot of this belongs to us and has been kept from us um, for hundreds of years. And then they have the nerve uh, to tell us to pull us up by our own bootstraps when they was the one using our bootstraps to pull themselves up. So I, I don't I don't get that uh, that contradiction. But all it's of down things, to um, the way we talk too. I don't know if anybody noticed, but the small things and even things we do during the holidays and the root definition to the stuff we use, like Jingle Bells. Jingle Bells was, you know, this chain around our, a slave neck with bells that the slave owner would hear from their house if we was trying to escape. That's where Jingle Bells came from. That's and the even first with, time I've I think heard that. Black Friday, Black Friday too, is based on a discount for when you could buy your slaves. So it's a lot of stuff that goes into the way we choose to go about things today that we don't even think about how it came up. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. And, and again, a lot of that is us being forced to assimilate into their culture. So we had yeah. to take on their holidays like the 4th of July. We weren't free on July 4th, 1776. So I don't know what we celebrate that for. I still can't understand that. Our 4th of July or our Independence Day is coming up this weekend, June 19th, which is Friday. So June 10th is our actual Independence Day. So I will be celebrating June 10th, uh, Juneteenth uh, this weekend. So June 19th, which is Juneteenth, uh, that is Black Liberation or Black Independence Day. And I will be celebrating that this weekend. And we are also be celebrating uh, Sabira's graduation this weekend. Yay, congrats. And congrats. her younger sister, Sophia, graduated uh, eighth grade and is going to high school. So we'll be celebrating that as well. And uh, yeah, so that that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, July 4th, to me, is just another day. Um, we're about to get ready to wrap up. I know Sue Hala has to get ready for work. So Sue, if you, if you, can, if you need to leave and sign off at any time, you're more than welcome to do so. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate you. You gave some really, really good answers. All of you did. Let me just say this before Suhaila goes. Uh, I don't know if y'all been paying attention to what Penny has been posting in the group chat over here, but our listening audience is loving you ladies, okay? They're loving your intelligence. They're loving your maturity. They're loving a lot of the answers that y'all are giving. And I must say, I am, I am, very, very impressed with what you all said today and uh, how eloquently you spoke and, and put your, your pain and your feelings into words and expressed it. So great job, everybody. Uh, tell that to, you, to your little friend at work, Sue, when you oh, see him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, you have a great day at work and I appreciate your time, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right, uh, Sabira and S Salia, we're gonna get ready to wrap this up. Uh, I want to end, you know, all of this stuff we've been talking about is based in white supremacy and based in racism. So what are your thoughts on racism and how, how do we, how do we move past racism and get to a place where everyone is, is on equal footing? Um, uh, I definitely feel like it's a hard pill to swallow. And I feel like um, starting off by accepting the past, even though we all hate it, yeah. but we can't move forward from it if we always looking at each other about the past. Yes. You know, I, now that I moved down here, I've never been to a school that has been so diverse. Okay. Me being in Philly, I have always been surrounded of people my color. So when I moved down here, I was actually excited to see, you know, so much mixed um yeah. kids like when i was sitting in class they would have like full-on discussions about the amount of percentages of countries they was mixed from and how their um households and thanksgivings and you know cultures were mixed up and it was exciting to hear because i wasn't used to that i didn't grow around in a community full with so much you know diverse culture right. at at the same table so just to have that moment to be a product of change say how much further we could get so 
I feel like a start would be accepting the past because I sit in classes with these people um, who has no control over what happened or yeah. how to feel or how people look at them. And, you know, they have no, they have totally different um, ideas and perspective than their ancestors may have. Yeah. So they want change just as we do, but we just continue to look at them from their parents and yeah. from their ancestors. And sometimes it's just not their fault. Yeah. Sometimes it's what's been given to them. You're right. And you can't, you can only do so, you know, once it's been given to you, you have to become aware of the situation before you can do anything about it. And you're right. A lot of times it does come from the parents. Uh, I saw a video last night on Facebook of a high school, uh, a young high school white girl. She was in an argument with her parents about racism and her parents were defending racism and defending the death of George Floyd. Yeah, and, I seen. Yeah, and the young white girl was trying to tell them that that's not okay, and she's asking them why is it okay? You know, why is it okay for them to be racist? Like, why are they okay with being racist? You know what I mean? And she made some very valid points, and she couldn't have been more than 16, 17, 18 years old. Yeah. Um, and I felt, I felt like she could have been one of my little daughters. I was so proud of this little white girl for how she spoke up for Black Lives Matter and how she, her, her dad was telling her to sh just shut up and listen. And she was like, no, I'm not going to shut up and listen because you guys are wrong. And you got to, you know, stuck in this old antiquated uh, mind state that you need to move forward from. And she was like, we, you know, we can't move forward as a community and as a whole and as a world because people like y'all are still stuck in the 60s and the 50s. Like, mm -hmm. I was so proud of the young lady for her conversation. Uh, but it goes to the point that you just made. Um, you know, sometimes that's what you're given. And, and if you don't make a conscious effort to come out of that or move away from that, you're going to be. Yeah. And I think her father was in the back, like, I, I work with them. They're animals. Da, da, da. Yeah, that's and then she just like, no, no, they're not. Yeah. You don't know what they're capable of because they've never been given that opportunity to do better. Yeah. And yeah, like I was really proud of her too. Yeah, she, I was, she was like, dad, why don't you just, she said, have you ever thought about why they're in those situations, why they're in the ghettos and who put them in the ghetto? Like she was snapping on her parents. Like I had- Yeah, I was like, she could come to the barbecue. Oh, she come to the barbecue. <laughs> she could play space, all that. She got the invite all day. <laughs> yeah, uh, she could come. Right. <laughs> uh, Salia, what about you? What are you? What are your thoughts on racism? And uh... Um, it's sad to say, but honestly, I don't see a world where there's no racism because it's all I know. But at the same time, I would love to fight for it, and I would love to see the day that there's just no racism. Like every, you just view people for who they are and not the color of their skin. Yeah. Um, it's nothing about it is okay, and I agreed with everything Sabera was saying. So okay. So I know for myself, I don't think racism will be eradicated or ended in my lifetime. Do y'all yeah. think it could be eradicated in your lifetime? No. I will <laughs> hope so, but I don't think that there will ever be a Hold moment on, where it is absolutely none. Say that again, Sabir. I was saying that I hope so, but I don't think that there's a moment that there will absolutely, absolutely be zero racism. I okay. feel like everyone will have their bias moments, and sometimes, sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. But okay. lately, and what's going on, I hope that this is a moment that we can all look back on to say yeah. that we still fight in the same battle. So. Yeah. And this is, we're living in history. I feel like our, my kids, my grandkids, I feel like this is going to be something in the history book. I feel it like this definitely is, is. It's definitely, we are in, we are living some history right now. It, it is a lot of changes going on and we are definitely living in a historic moment right now. Um, Sally, you said you don't think racism will ever be eradicated or in your lifetime? In my lifetime, no, because I believe it's too many people alive today and that are passing on to their children that uh, think the way that they do. And I think it's just going to continue. Yeah. 
And you know, I thought that way for a very long time, Salia. I'm not even gonna lie. Um, but where I am now, like the video we were just talking about of the young white girl, videos mm -hmm. like that give me hope that uh, one day, someday, that racism will be ended. Uh, it, like I said, I don't think it'll be in my lifetime, but with each generation, I think it gets better. It has to get better yeah. each generation. And if these younger white people keep seeing the foolish ways of their older racist white people um, and, and commit to make changes about it, I, I think that we'll get to that place a lot sooner than later. It's gonna take a while, uh, I was told a long time ago that however long it takes to implement something, it takes twice as long to unimplement it. Meaning we've been in this current situation of slavery and oppression and all that stuff for about four or 500 years. So that means it's gonna take eight, 800 to a thousand years to undo what has been done. Um, so that's a very long time, but we have to keep fighting the good fight. We can't give up, we can't lose hope. Um, we can't lose sight of the future being better uh, than what we have it now. And so that's what I fight for. You know, I've been fighting in activism, fighting to make the world a better place for you guys and for your generation. And I'm sure you guys will fight to make it better for your generation. And that just has to continue and continue and continue for a very long time uh, for us to get out of this, this racist uh, environment. Um, all right. Last question, and then we're gonna get out of here. Um, Cause we were only supposed to do an hour. We're going on an hour and 45 minutes because the people have loved you guys so much. Okay, so again, great job and kudos to you ladies. Um, last question, should African-Americans in this country receive reparations for the racism and brutality we have endured in this country for the past four or 500 years? Salia. Wait, can you repeat that? Should African Americans in this country receive reparations for the racism and brutality we have endured in this country for the past four or five hundred years? Um, I don't know what reparations is. Reparations is money given to a people that has been uh, severely brutalized by a government. So, for instance, back in the forties and fifties, uh, that uh, we were in a war with Japan. Uh, so the American government created a bunch of Japanese internment camps where they just rounded up Japanese people or Asian people in this country and put them in camps. And you had to stay there until they figured out if you was a spy or whatever they was trying to figure out. And they held them there for a very long time. Well, those uh, that generation of Japanese people that they happened to, they got paid a substantial amount of money for having to go through that. In reparations, the word repair is in the word reparations. So reparations are given in, in an attempt to repair the wrongs that you have done mm -hmm. uh, to a certain group of people. So wow. the debate has been going on for a long time if African Americans in this country should receive some type of reparations for the racism and brutality that we have been doing for four or five hundred years. Do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing, right or wrong? Yes or no? I say yes, because a lot of people are living the poor lifestyles that we live now because of the red lining and um, is that the right word for it? red lines? Yes. Well, yeah, because of that and um, because of racism and because of how things were many years ago. So I think money would help them um, come up from those places in these poor areas and yeah. to be equal. Yeah. So, yeah. You're right. And to your point, um, I don't know if you know this, and that would help. I mean, it wouldn't repair everything that they've done, but it would definitely help. Um, and I was about to make a point, and I forgot it that quick. Okay. Anywho, um, Sabir, what do you think uh, about reparations? Um, I do think that I do think that it will help, but there's, like you said, there's some stuff that you cannot change. There's no amount of money that can fix some things. Yeah. And I think that that's mostly things that are internal in the way that people feel. You know, I feel like it will uplift a community and it will look out in some type of way, but not completely. You know, there's just yeah. some things that cannot be 
erased or fixed with money thrown at us. Right. That's uh, I kind of feel like at the same time, um, with the money, it's just like, like she said, money does not fix everything. Like, um, it's like, oh, um, y'all were oppressed for so many years, so therefore we're gonna pay for that. That 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 kind of in a way relates to like, oh, um, the police killing the citizens and then paying the family for it. Right. It doesn't. Yeah. It does like that money is not worth anything for of what happened, but right. like I'm sure it had definitely has helped their family. Like I'm like George Floyd's daughter, I'm sure she has her a lot of money set for her future with college and stuff. Yeah. But I'm I know she just want her dad, and it's yeah. like, um, it goes to um, like getting money for everything that had happened in the past is like it. We just wish it never happened. You know, we just want to. Like the money is not the same as to just being equal, yeah. like um, in society. It's like it's like me getting a life sentence to prison, and somebody figure out that I wasn't wrong, that I was I wasn't wrong, and um, you know that somebody proved my innocence, and yeah. then I get to go back home to see my family and all. But it's like we're sorry, but you can't give me back that time yeah you can't you know it's like it could fix something thank you for taking me out i get to see my family but don't forget i was in here for five years still right so or it's 20, like yeah, people did 20 30 40 years and we're in it. yeah 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 and another thing i want to say for the youth is to pay attention to um pay attention to the influencers that you're watching you know it's influencers that are getting attention for stealing the black culture and acting like us, but where are they? At least where are they blackout Tuesday posts and right. stuff like that? Yeah. So it it's a time to pay attention at times like this. At times, at the worst, shows people's emotions and true colors. So it's time to pay attention to that too. Yeah, what you just said reminds me of a quote I heard before that said. Everybody wants to be black until it's really time to be black. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they want our culture, our music, our dances and all that stuff. But when it comes to speaking up against racism and people getting shot down in the street, then they they mum and they quiet. Um, so, but yeah, but so Sally, I, I remember what I was gonna say to you earlier, you had mentioned something about the money uh, may help to put people on some type of equal level playing field, right? Um, mm -hmm. When when Lincoln first freed us uh, from slavery, um, we were supposed to get forty acres in a mule. Y'all heard about that? Did y'all ever hear that? Like you all, say the free, it again? all the free slaves, Lincoln was supposed to give us forty acres in a mule. Oh yeah. Uh, to all the free slaves, once they got free, to give them a hand in getting started in life once they gained their freedom. Uh, but then Lincoln got killed, and the person that came in after him, I forgot his name. He vetoed that and was like, no, we're not giving them, we're not giving all these black people 40 acres in a mule because that will be giving them too much of an upper hand and putting them on too much of a level playing field with us. And so we're not going to do that. And so that's one of the reasons um, the United States government now still fights tooth and nail to not have to give us uh, reparations. And no reparations wouldn't fix everything but it would be a good start to the healing process. Um, Penny said, freedom and equality are good, but without an economic stipend, we're still poor and I still want mine. Amen mm -hmm. to that. <laughs> Amen, Pastor Penny. Uh, I appreciate that word. And we're going to end it with that. Let me read that one more time. And this is from the words of Pastor Penny, okay? Freedom and equality are good, but without an economic stipend, we're still poor, and I still want mine. Right on, <laughs> <laughs> right on. Uh, I want to say thank you. Wait, before I go, I got to do my scholars of the week. My scholars of the week, and my scholar of the week goes to the young ladies that I had on my show today: uh, Suhaila Collins, Sabira Mansour. Balia Shahid, uh, I, I commend you ladies. Um, I, I respect you all for getting through this education system that was not meant for us. 
in excelling at it and doing well and then going to the next level. Uh, Sabira, you're going to the next level and I'm sure you will too, Solomon. Uh, I commend you all for that. I commend you for coming on my show and expressing yourself with very valid points and in very meaningful ways. Um, I appreciate that you all did a great job. You're beautiful, you're intelligent. Don't let nobody tell you different. You're able to do anything you set your mind to. Um, I'm glad, like Penny tells me all the time, I'm glad to know y'all. Y'all made me very proud today. Okay. Thank, thank you. So thank you very much. Oh, your mother's over here giving the uh, <laughs> the black power fist. Good, doc, good job to Jayla Collins, their mother, who is, uh, she is the vice president for my nonprofit organization, Alchemy Artisan Inc. And before I go, uh, there is a blackout day coming on 2020. I thought I just, oh, July 7th, 2020 is the blackout day. And that is supposed to be with TI uh, leading that charge. So on May, uh, July 7th, 2020, they want a blackout day where we don't spend any money. In case y'all don't know, young ladies, the black community has $1.3 trillion in spending power. $1.3 trillion. So yeah, we have the money to build our own that's, black Wall Street. Huh? That's what I was talking about when I was like talking about like going on strike. And like because we give them a lot of money and if we just don't we, buy nothing, they're gonna lose a lot, almost as much as us looting. Yeah, because we're could because just as much as we created this economic system, we're still a huge part of this economic system. So mm -hmm. we can do a lot with our $1.3 trillion in spending power. If we unify, we can rebuild Black Wall Street in Seneca Village. Seneca Village was another Black Wall Street that was in New York that was a community of thriving African-Americans that was torn down so they could put Central Park up. Okay, so we have the ability, we have the spending power to do anything that we want to do. The main thing we have to do is unify and work together to either destroy these systems that are oppressing us and bringing us down or build our own new system uh, that will uplift us and unify us, okay? So mm -hmm. thank you to my listening audience. Thank you uh, for tuning in. You've been watching Conversations in Education. This is WCEGtalkradio.com, the worldwide community empowerment group where we are here to uplift and empower the community. Thank you all very much. And until next time, peace and blessings. Thank you very much. Great show. I loved it. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, Penny. Bye, bye, Vince. Thank you all so much. Our audience wants you to come back with the Young Men's Panel next. Oh, will do. Yes, they have been blowing up the chat, and I've been. That's why I've been kind of talking to you all most of the show. I'm sorry if I was distracting, but I wanted to let you know our You're listeners fine. were engaged. Yes, they were, they were engaged. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Y'all take care. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. That's Jayla. Bye -bye. Um, you did a wonderful bye. job, mother. Wonderful Thank job. You. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Peace and blessings. Bye. 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 bye.